Anime. You know what it is. I don't need to explain. On the internet or off, pretty much everybody under 80 has seen some kind of anime, even if they didn't realize. As a medium, it's been dubbed into English and... <coughs> Varying qualities. Kakaroto is mine. Nobody touches him. Not even you. And brought over to the West since the 60s, and the practice still continues today with a few main dubbing companies reigning supreme. Mainly Sentai Filmworks, Viz Media, and above all of them, Funimation. In as weirdly cutthroat a business as the anime dubbing industry, it's not uncommon to see companies go out of business, yet Funimation seems to be the one that's always able to adapt into the next era, and there's plenty of praise to levy at the company for that reason alone. However, only so much praise can be given before you need to bring up Funny's numerous flaws, and fans have been bringing those flaws up in small to large capacity for over a decade now. From poor releases to hypocrisy to general slimy practices, Funimation has lately gotten a reputation in much of the anime community for being tone deaf, corporate, and greedy. How could such a giant that was once so well regarded by fans end up in such a position? Well, to take apart why something is considered bad, you need to know why it was considered good in the first place. That brings me to the beginning of the company. Funimation was originally founded in 1994 by Jin Fukunaga, based in North Richland Hills, Texas, for the express purpose of getting the English licensing rights to a popular anime at the time, Dragon Ball Z. By this time, the original Dragon Ball anime had not yet been dubbed, so the small team got together talent from Vancouver's Ocean Studios and began working on a 26-episode dub, but due to low ratings, it was quickly cancelled halfway through. Despite this setback and the anime scene being actually quite barren at the time other than Sailor Moon, which initially failed to catch on in the West, the team decided to go ahead dubbing Dragon Ball Z with a similar cast in 1996. It did well ratings-wise, but it was cancelled after two seasons. Thankfully, this was around the beginning of anime's big boost in the West, and so around this time, another big dubbing company, 4Kids, had struck gold with their Americanized versions of Pokemon and Yu-Gi-Oh!, leading to Cartoon Network creating the programming block called Toonami for anime content specifically. With reruns of DBZ doing well on there, Funimation decided to continue dubbing the series with the, at the time, new in-house talent we know very well today, including Chris Sabat and Sean Schimmel. While Funny was being overshadowed by 4Kids at the time, it was still doing very well, and soon enough, they'd be able to find a niche the modern anime fans of the 2000s were craving more than anything. Garuga Mesh! Oh yeah! yeah. I love anime! Yeah. Yeah. And manga! With the rise of the internet, so did the accessibility to anime uncut straight from its country of origin. Very few, if any, companies in the beginning of the 2000s really created subbed anime in a publishable format, so the main way to see the original intent of the Japanese creators was either through manga or torrented fan subbing. When it came to dubbed anime on translation accuracy, well, remember when I said 4 kids struck gold with Americanized dubs? What I meant by that is, as is well known at this point, localizing the material to appeal to Western children's audiences. To put it simply, in Japan, there's a much looser censor board for children's television. It's allowed much more room for blood, swearing, sexual innuendos, and everything else your mom didn't like you seeing at that age. Obviously, that wouldn't fly in the US for kids aged 7 to 13, so in addition to censoring or editing out most of this content, many meetings around what happened to characters were changed, such as the infamous Shadow Realm and Yu-Gi-Oh! alluding to death. Some of the most egregious edits can be seen in shows like One Piece, that would remove entire story arcs, create plot holes in the process, and turn all weapons other than swords into literal toys. It became so severe in some cases that companies like 4Kids would intentionally remove text from several of their shows which were already in English for no apparent reason. With such unnecessary changing of the source material to appeal to young Western audiences, anime fans would be desperate for some proper, unedited dubbing outside of movies like Akira and Ghost in the Shell that originally came to America in uncensored episodes of Dragon Ball Z by Funimation on DVD sets. This did only take place after the original censored 67 episode dub had concluded, so many episodes in the DVD sets were missing from all the censorship, but getting anything uncensored was a dream come true to begin with. After this string of releases, Funimation would only continue releasing more and more dubs uncensored. They eventually became the go-to dubbing company, and most people watching dubbed anime currently are sure to see their logo at some point for just how spread out they are. Unfortunately, Funimation isn't exactly the monolith of content that can do no wrong, as we were led to believe at one point. There are actually many issues with Funimation in terms of its practices as a company and those involved with it, starting with the censorship and dialogue changes. Now, it may seem as though I just said something that didn't line up with the description I was painting before. Funimation is supposed to be the awesome company responsible for all the uncut dubs for the real fans that want to get the full experience out of their anime. And that's true, uh... 
to an extent. For the most part, Funimation is fair in their translations when adapting the source material, but sometimes they'll intentionally change the entire meaning of a joke or piece of dialogue to include modern references or be, in the eyes of the screenwriter, quote, funnier. For example, one of the funniest anime I know, Prison School, had a scene where a girl was talking to one of the main characters, and in the dub, uh, I can't articulate it, just watch. Have you got a stick up your ass? Or are you one of those dumbass Gamergate creep shows? <laughs> Yeah, needless to say, that wasn't in the original. In another, a character is defending girls in a cafe from their boss, who says they should read dirty books to make them flustered, and customers like that. In the dub, it's changed to be about men hating women and just wanting to see them being degraded. It also includes the words SJW, cuck, and more swearing, because I suppose that's funny now. In general, it kinda just gives off a different vibe entirely. For another show, Miss Kobayashi's Dragon Maid, here's a pretty infamous change. What are you wearing that for? Oh, those pesky patriarchal societal demands were getting on my nerves. So I changed clothes. Give it a week, they'll be begging you to change back. Even on shows I've never heard of, where you wouldn't expect changes like Bofuri, there are small lines changed. It's quite evident in some of their shows that dialogue has been changed to, I suppose be more politically correct or humorous to American audiences. But that's not what anime fans pay for, nor want. They want exact, or at least as close as possible, translations to the original material. They want something that has the exact same dialogue, but in English. We're not children who need to have right Ice balls turned into sandwiches, or referred to as donuts. That's what the watered-down, censored, kid-friendly anime were for. Subbed anime in general is a better option for getting the original intent, but it isn't completely safe from Funimation either. For instance, in one of the episodes for Kaguya-sama Life is War, they added lines about social distancing during the pandemic. With these kinds of dumb changes made to shows that didn't need it, how can we trust that Funimation is always going to give us the correct translations and not some other bullshit the writer thought was funny? I suppose we'll just have to watch both versions now to make sure we aren't missing out on any context. I'm glad I watched some shows in Japanese first because it helped me realize just how much Funimation changes lines for shows. Of course, this can be worse for some shows than others. Crayon Shin-chan is a decently funny show about a lower class family. As a sign-in show, it's got some adult humor in there, some dark jokes, but Funimation went completely overkill with this series. They added tons of pop culture references for shows and people that weren't things when the original anime aired. They changed jokes, the context around characters, and tons more. It makes me weep for those that wanted a direct Shin-chan dub because this is the only official version. Sometimes they even switched around episode order and segment order for no particular reason. It honestly makes no sense to me, and I'd go as far as to say it feels like if 4Kids was made for teens. Tons of jokes in Italia are just changed to cursing or various contexts which aren't as funny. The second season especially has so much unnecessary goddamn changing, it's kinda baffling to me how this is supposed to be the official dub. I don't know why they're able to do it, but sometimes Funimation just changes so much of the original material to where it feels like an abridged series. Series. This isn't, nor has it ever been, what fans wanted, and in many cases, they're sick of all these changes. It just doesn't feel like they treat all their properties with equal respect. On one occasion, Funimation even started a dub for a series, but then they stopped for a pretty dumb reason. That show they decided to stop dubbing was called Interspecies Reviewers. To summarize it briefly, the show is a comedy about these mystical heroes in a fantasy setting going off to the brothels across their land and rating their experiences with the girls there. It's supposed to be a comical deconstruction of fairy tale type plots with goody-goody protagonists, instead having more morally ambiguous ones that just want to get laid. Obviously, anyone who could understand that type of premise would have to expect a certain level of risqueity to it, but apparently Funimation wasn't expecting it and decided to drop the series because it didn't meet their quote, standards. And this was pretty funny in itself. Funimation has been shown on many occasions to dub less than savory shows, such as Valkyrie Drive Mermaid, a series that's basically like Soul Eater, except you have to make the weapons aroused before they change. Look through their catalog and you'll be able to find other bordering shows just like this, such as Heaven's Lost Property and The Testament of Sister New Devil. So it does lead to the question, uh... What standards is Funimation speaking of? When have they had such integrity to not broadcast a show like Interspecies Reviewers when they've done much worse before? This show has a censored version to begin with, so what's the problem? Even if they weren't going to dub the series in the first place, that'd be one thing. But they pulled out after going through the trouble of licensing it and doing three or so episodes before backing out as if they didn't know what the show was about. There's no way they couldn't have known about the plot or risque aspects. It's evident from the first episode, and if they really didn't know, it could just be a 
case of them picking something up without even knowing what it's about. And if we want to talk about standards, I think that says much more about them and their general company practices rather than when they chose to stop dubbing it. It's also quite funny how they're deciding to keep a hold of the dub rights to it despite not actually using it just so that other people can't do it. Because you know what? Fuck the fans! And also, fuck the source material! You know, while we're at it, since we're still on how poorly Funimation treats some source material and makes the customer feel unfulfilled, let's talk about their physical media and practices relating to it. Funimation has always had troubles with its home media. That isn't to say it's all terrible, but the way they go about selling episodes sometimes really makes my blood boil. As an anime fan, you might feel the need to support a physical release of the media, whether it just be supporting your favorite franchise or adding it to your vast collection. And oh boy, Funimation will not make it easy for you. They keep everything tidy, that's for sure, but their release schedule and pricing always baffles me. For example, My Hero Academia. The first season is released in 13 episodes. It gets a single release. After that, MHA has a 25 episode second season. Logically, you'd expect the box set to wait a little longer with all episodes being dubbed, but instead, Funimation will opt to separate the season into two parts. This isn't exactly from a lack of space for holding the discs, no, no, no. They have the ability to do that. It's just they're releasing it in part so the hungry consumer who really wants the physical release as soon as possible can buy it straight away instead of waiting for the full season to come out. That's right, they release two parts, then they also come out with the season set. I wouldn't have as much of a problem with this if the split up sets didn't cost so much. Looking at Funimation's website, they sell each MHA Blu-ray part for $50. That's the standard for them. That means if you want to watch a 25 episode series, or season, you need to pay $100 plus tax. That kind of price is honestly outrageous when thinking in comparison to other box sets of similar volume. I picked up Avatar on Blu-ray for $35. That's 60 episodes right there. You could make the argument that that show is old and therefore not worth as much now, and fair enough. My Rick and Morty Blu-rays cost me about $25 each for 10 episodes. Hell, going to anime, I have both the Mob Psycho 100 and One Punch Man Collector's Edition box sets. Both of these cost me around $50. And as far as features, Mob Psycho has its basic set of 12 episodes with Blu-ray, DVD, and other other really basic features. The One Punch Man Collector's Edition has the Blu-ray and DVD in a more stylish variant, an extensive art book with concept designs and so on, six extra OVA episodes adding on to its base 12, making it basically 18. It also comes with a stylish cover and casing, virtually the same price. The difference here? Mob Psycho is owned by Funimation, whereas One Punch Man is owned by Viz Media. I think this shows in general just how much extra Funimation seems to charge for no extra reward beyond having the product itself. It probably should be considered the industry standard, but like I said, Funimation is the biggest dubbing company in the West with the largest distribution rights, so it's live by their rules or get nothing most of the time. At the least, their collection sets of 25 episodes or so are cheaper and generally are easier to collect. But with them still releasing the standalone parts alongside it, for larger series in particular, it feels like the market is being a bit oversaturated and harder to find in stores. A reason for the increased price could have a little something to do with Funny's weird insistence of having Blu-ray discs all also contain its DVD equivalent with it. When it comes to movies, I can at least get it. It's a small case with two sides. Having the DVD on the other is a small, convenient addition, or whatever. I still see it as pointless, but it's harmless. The issue arises when Funny decides to do this for their 24 episode box sets. It actively takes up much more space, and thinking logically, what's even the point? I bought the Blu-ray so I can watch my anime in the best quality possible. I specifically looked up a Blu-ray and received it in a Blu-ray case, so why would someone think I'd like the DVD version as well? well. It's just an inferior to the Blu-ray in standard def. What, is it in case the disc gets too scratched and I have a backup? That's what a warranty is for, not an inferior to what I was paying for. Or does Funimation just think I'm that dense of a fuck that I decide to switch out which I play with randomly because I don't know the difference? Hmm, I don't know honey, the, the DVDs are calling to me today. When has that line of thought ever crossed someone's mind? This dumbass standard they picked has been so used that it's affected other collector's editions I've bought. One time I decided to buy Danganronpa the Animations Collector's Edition for $50. Do you know what it was? It was a cardboard case around two incredibly cheap feeling Blu-ray boxes. The thing being, one of the boxes was for the DVD version, so they just put the DVDs in a Blu-ray box. What laziness. What unnecessary detail 
to add to this already lackluster purchase. If my theory is correct, that would mean that if they got rid of the DVD, it would make it so smaller Blu-ray boxes could be made, less time would need to be put into making them, and overall, it would cost less. But no, I'm just an idiot, because here's them selling half of Demon Slayer as only a Blu-ray for the same price. The DVDs were apparently worth less than nothing, so I feel justified in using them for coasters and projectiles to throw at my exes while running by. What's even worse about all this home media crap is their inconsistency. Like I said, for whatever reason, Demon Slayer got a Blu-ray exclusive release. My Hero Academia also has some only DVD releases, but as far as I can tell, not only Blu-ray releases. You have to get the combo. I tell ya, nothing irks me more than inconsistency, and I'm seeing this shit a ton right here. Beyond general physical media, Funimation is well known for their infamous attempts to translate Dragon Ball Z to box sets. Originally, the series came in over 80 3 to 4 episode sets. The episodes were actually in good quality, but it was a hassle to get them all. Also, as I mentioned, the first 67 episodes were originally dubbed and censored by another company, so Funimation began filling in those episodes to make the whole set consistent, using a series called the Ultimate Uncut DVDs. For whatever reason though, they stopped midway, and the large, tedious to collect DVD sets remain unfinished to this day. To make it easier for people to collect the series, in 2007 they began releasing, uh the orange bricks. I cannot tell you just how much I and many others hate these things. What happened with them was that Funimation decided to take Dragon Ball Z, a show with a 4x3 aspect ratio, and zoom in, losing much of the details and such in the process, to make it 16x9 for modern TVs. That isn't all though. They also used digital noise reduction, a method that removes grain from TV or film because I guess grain is bad. And when that happens, and it's done poorly, much of the detail from the original shot can be lost along with adding huge, noticeable, eye-bleeding color saturation. For some reason, Funimation decided to stick with this for all nine seasons of The Orange Bricks, and they're now virtually unwatchable with the terrible quality given to them. Unfortunately, they were still cheap, available, and the easiest way to watch one of the most popular anime ever made. So of course it sold well. It sold so well that many people actually think that the terrible look is just Dragon Ball style. Like it was actually meant to look this shitty. Newsflash, it wasn't. Funimation just did a terrible, rushed, cheap job. What makes this even more sad is that years before the Orange Bricks released in America, Japan had one of the best Dragon Ball Z releases ever in the Dragon Boxes. These DVD sets were, and still are, considered the best way to watch Dragon Ball currently. They were released in 2003 by Toei themselves, taking the original 16mm film masters of the show as reference to create one of the most faithful adaptations to make the media look like it did on broadcast. It wasn't perfect, some of the coloring was a bit faded, but to Funimation's credit, they did release this in the West, and it remains great. The thing is, around the same time they started releasing it in America, Dragon Ball Kai, an abridged version of the original, began being made, so Funimation started releasing Blu-ray parts for that, and eventually sets. In this pandemonium of hype around all these releases, some good, some meh, Funimation thought it would be a good idea to also start releasing Dragon Ball Z on Blu-ray with the level sets. Now let me tell you this, the level sets are indeed amazing. They digitally cleaned up the shots lovingly without removing the grain and making the image look even closer to the original broadcast in the dragon boxes and they did it all in-house. This was something that fans were craving but like I said this was at the worst possible time. The dragon boxes had only just finished being released in seven sets two months ago and they were expensive. People had also been busy buying Kai Blu-rays so therefore the level sets only got two editions and were cancelled afterwards because of low sales. The production was just too expensive for the little returns. When you look at it the only reason the level sets failed was because of Funimation and how they handled the releases. If you want more in-depth analysis on that, Tony Strong Style has a good dissection of it. But anyhow, somehow, despite it clearly just being bad timing that made the level sets fail, Funny got the idea from this that because the orange bricks were popular and the level sets weren't, going forward, they'd make something similar to the former for the Dragon Ball Z Blu-ray season sets. Can you guess what they did for that? I'll give you one guess. If you said they made it in 16x9 again, got rid of the grain, cropped the video again, added weird sharpness to the colors but blurred to the lines, and so much more you'd think Funny would have learned from in the first place, you'd be fucking correct. 
take a gold star. That brings me to the most recent release of Dragon Ball Z. This release is so insulting, so disliked, so hated, that the DBZ fans just had to speak up. For once, they finally had enough of Funimation shit with the announcement of the 30th anniversary box set. Hilariously, one of the main selling points of this set was seeing it as it was meant to be, in the original 4x3 aspect ratio, acting like the last 10 years never happened. To add on to that, they still used digital noise reduction and made the colors, textures, and so on look worse. They zoomed the image in worse than the pristine level sets, so we know it can be done correctly by them, they added a grain filter to make it look like grain was still there after they removed it, and so, yeah, fans were a bit pissed that this was supposed to be the best version selling for $350 retail. It got so much bad press that the set took a week to reach its goal of 3,000 purchases before going into production. What? You thought Funimation teaming up with Toei would lead to them just creating the set on their own for the property they were originally founded around? Nonsense! What are you, stupid?! The only only conclusion I can reach for them asking fans to reach a goal for them to put this into production is even they had such low expectations for their shitty product that they thought it wouldn't sell well. What a train wreck of a release. How could this have been so hard? They gave decent releases for GT and the original Dragon Ball back in the 2000s. I guess this just confirms my theory that Funimation has always cared more about GT than they did about the inferior Z. What great business decisions they make. While I'm on how great the business decisions are, let's get into some of the real controversies they've gotten into over time. One of Funimation's staples nowadays is hating any and all fan subs for anime they've already subbed for or are planning to do so with. In 2011, they tried to sue BitTorrent users for sharing an episode of One Piece, but it didn't go through because they obviously weren't working together. Having their fee severely ruffled, Funimation then apparently went forum shopping and sued over 1,400 individual people for what they watched. And yeah, that's kind of fucked up since Funimation themselves have been shown to use fan subs for their own dubbing. The reality of fan subs is that in many cases it's there, it's ready, and it's convenient. Funimation may say they hold this community to some kind of holier-than-thou standard when it comes to pirating or fan subs, but they still have the guts to then turn around and base those fan subs for their dubbing process, and even on social media use some screenshots from Kiss Anime. Not to mention some people are forced to pirate with their region-locked website. It's kind of shitty that they wouldn't try to make it more open to the people outside of the US, UK, Australia, and so on. I should also mention that in many cases the pirating site sites actually have better layouts and features than the official Funimation one. Ooh boy, this site and related app have been infamous for their poor quality. When using the Funimation app, it's common to deal with long, boring, tedious load times for shows. In some cases, you'll receive ads when watching something, even if you've just purchased premium. If you want to cancel, it can be difficult to do so with their process. When watching shows, there isn't an autoplay button for episodes or auto skip for intros and outros. These are all issues pointed out in the user reviews of people on the App Store. The Funimation app has a three out of five stars. For an app as big as this, that's abysmal. For some reason, Funimation doesn't seem to get that some might just pirate because it's easier and more efficient. If you can't offer better, the consumer is going to move to the one that can. If you want to be on top for that market again, Funimation, change up your website to be more like that of Hulu, Netflix, and other successful layouts. Besides all that, the biggest lawsuit everyone's known Funimation for in the past two years is that of the case relating to Vic Mignogna. You may know him as the voice of Edward Elric in Full Metal Alchemist, Broly in Dragon Ball, Crow and Ruby, and Captain Kirk in the web series Star Trek Continues. Clearly a well-versed actor with many fans and boundless talent. He's also known for being a very loving person who cares about the fans. Then, suddenly, several allegations began popping up about Vic, including small stuff that had been bubbling under for a while. Among these claims, one rather flimsy argument asserted Vic was homophobic for refusing to sign yaoi fan art of Full Metal Alchemist characters. Another claimed he was anti-Semitic for calling a loud room next door at a panel, quote, a holocaust. Another accusation brought up how intimate Vic had been with fans in the past, and some photos hugging or even kissing them on the cheek. Some have claimed this is evidence that Vic abuses his power over people and is generally creepy, but Vic has always been an affectionate guy coming from an Italian family where it's common practice. Some of the people being heralded as uncomfortably shown hugging Vic and such in pictures would later speak out, saying that they actually asked Vic to do this for them and that it was completely consensual, therefore making the pics out of context and blowing all of the other claims of a similar nature into question. Another person made an accusation that over a decade ago when she was a minor, Vic groped her in some fashion in an elevator. She also stated that she and her friend were groomed by Vic via the internet in a similar way, having merch and other things sent to them. She provided no evidence for this and it appears like something that's virtually impossible to prove, yet a hashtag on Twitter started called hashtag kick Vic. Upon these accusations being levied, Vic made a statement where he elaborated that he only didn't sign Yaoi art because it wasn't canon, that he was only making a joke about a holocaust, not the 
the Holocaust, and yes, they're different meanings. Also, it was just a dumb joke. I doubt there would be anything that could point to that being actual hate for Jewish people. I find the statement of him being homophobic especially hilarious because there's a famous video of him as a Christian walking up to two anti-gay people and defending them in the eyes of the Christian God. On the bit about his intimacy with fans, he stated as well that he would no longer be doing this hugging and such even if asked, and he made an apology to anyone who may have felt uncomfortable even though he was asked a majority of the time. Overall, quite a professional, good response that cleans up any accusations that had any actual merit at the time. After these initial claims, Monica Real of all people came out and claimed the accusations against Vic were true, stating she'd been victimized by him herself. For those who don't know Monica Real, she's a voice actor that's done hundreds of various roles, and it's most likely you've heard her voice somewhere. Anyway, she claimed in 2005 that Vic brought her to a hotel room and non-consensually kissed her, afterwards distancing herself from him. Yet, with her extensive interactions with Vic over the years, it wasn't hard to find videos where this claim of distancing was completely shattered. At a panel in 2009 or so, Monica actually initiates a hug from Vic after the incident would have taken place. There are also plenty of videos after this supposed incident where they're friendly, nice towards one another, and as mentioned previously, sometimes in an affectionate manner. If someone had been abused as Monica claimed by Vic, these kind of instances would not exist, especially those in which she initiates the gesture itself and seems very comfortable doing so. Another one of Monica's actual claims revolves around an incident where she wrote her name on a jelly bean, Vic ate it, and he apparently did so in a weird way, saying he ate Monica. This is an actual claim that's supposed to be taken seriously. Even if it did happen, and it very well might have, that's literally nothing at all. Another accuser from Funimation, Jamie Markey, stated she was harassed by Vic when he pulled her hair and whispered something sexual in her ear, and this turned out to just be a playful thing he did when complimenting her about a new hairstyle. And when I say that, I mean he did not whisper anything at all, he just touched her hair and complimented it. He's been on record saying he did the same thing with Rial because she tends to change her hair up a lot. Back to Markey, she's been shown in many instances being very playful with Vic on stage for years, acting like close friends, and at some point, she's even initiated situations such as a fake kissing behind a fan scene. All their statements of this happening without proof and distancing themselves afterwards kind of fall apart when you look at all the interactions they've had over the course of their public interactions. Other than Rial and Richie, there were a few other unsubstantiated accusers, and in the midst of these allegations, one of those people accusing Vic at Funimation claimed their door was busted down, saying she was swatted because fans of Vic had called them. This entire claim is completely false, as the same pictures could be found on her Facebook a year earlier for a completely different event. As one of the people calling out Vic along with others at Funimation, this obviously looks incredibly suspicious. People like Sean Schimmel, the voice of Goku, still initially supported the claim of swatting, and after it was disproven, he claimed it was still happening as he got a call from a specific police station saying they'd been given calls about something happening. Unfortunately for Sean, some people went to see if this was true by calling the only police station he could possibly be referring to, and they said they never received nor gave any calls of that name. Again, highly suspicious. Chris Sabat, another person who also stood with the accusers, has been shown to dislike Vic as well, with Chuck Hubert, a different voice actor, weighing in that Chris disliked Vic for being openly Christian and even called him gay for the way he dressed. Finally, after everything was said and done, the end result of all these allegations from VAs and such was Vic's firing from both Funimation and Rooster Teeth almost immediately, effectively ending many lines of his voice acting career. After all of this took place, Vic decided he would strike back with a lawsuit for defamation. He mostly indicted Monica, her fiancé Ron Toy, Marky, and Funimation for defamation in a case, asking for a million dollars in relief funds. The four all filed anti-slap measures to have the case dismissed. First, Marky was let off the hook. Then, the other three subsequently were allowed to have the cases dismissed. Vic asked for an appeal, and a disposition was held where they each gave their side of the story. I've seen some clips, and from what I can tell, it is honestly kind of heart-wrenching watching the entire thing, and Manana would end up having to drop the case. For an extra sting, Funimation also made Vic pay out of pocket for over $250,000 in attorney fees. With this entire situation, there's much more to it, but I don't want to make the majority of this video about the trial and case alone. So I'll just say, based on the evidence given, it feels as though a Funimation and its crew were just waiting for a chance to throw Vic under the bus, and this was their chance. With the lack of evidence for their case, and counter evidence to dispute their claims being provided, many have gotten the impression that Monica, Marky, and Toy are all unprofessional, somewhat slimy people. I have a different section for another bit of controversy Marky caused, but 
Toy has been found being rather childish on Twitter, and Rial has done the same. Against the Kikvik movement, the I Stand With Vic community has been growing strong all this time, and is still large today. Many still stand with Minyana in this case, and with how Funimation has treated some other VAs, it does feel quite selective in who they choose to let off the hook or not. For one, this is Scott Freeman. He's a voice actor that was arrested under eight charges for suspicion of having CP. He had been a voice actor at Funimation for about seven years, and as can be shown by his appearances, he continued to work for Funimation before being convicted of it in 2015 and becoming a registered sex offender, only then having the company finally decide to fire him. Really took one for the team, guys. In another, much more recent instance, smaller VA Chris Furman was found to be sending explicit messages to girls on Discord. Specifically, what he would do is he'd talk to them for a while, accidentally send them a dong photo, and then go on to brag about just how well endowed he is. This would be bad on its own, but one of these people he was talking to was 15, and he knew they were 15. The evidence was so irrefutable he didn't even deny it, but he made sure to say he was in a dark place at the time. I'm really weeping for him, I tell ya. Last case I'll bring up is that of Illich Guardiola, a guy who, as a 41-year-old man, fell in love with one of his 16-year-old students, and he subsequently married her in Las Vegas with the mother's blessing somehow. He never went to trial, but yeah, it's easy to say he wasn't exactly coming back to funny. My point of bringing this all up is to show Funimation has hired confirmed predators for their shows. In some cases, not firing them straight away, yet Vic got claimed by a few people with no evidence to substantiate it, and he ends up being fired and paying for their legal fees after he sues them for defamation. How does that really happen? I I'm not sure, but if they just got rid of him for Vic's general behavior, then they should see what some of their own VAs are like on Twitter. First, how about we mosey back to our friend Jamie Markey. In recent times, she's been shown making a fret about a bold move she made at a panel once, directed at the criticism around dub changes and such. Her response? It's a blur of garble and complete nonsense, but from what I remember, something about her having a, a vagina, vagina being a funny, funny woman, woman and deal you gotta with deal with it, and that <laughs> she's I'm happy to piss off misogynists and Nazis, and Nazis I'm sorry you don't get laid. laid. She retweeted this and said, thank you for sharing this. I think the only reason I have guts is because I don't have any other choice. She goes on to elaborate that she got hate from quote, gamer gators for the prison school that she didn't apparently write, and that it ruined her career because everyone afterwards went through her work with a fine tooth comb. Funny how she mentioned she wrote for Hitalia because, like I said before, that show got rewritten to hell and not in a good way. She goes on to keep sucking her own non-existent appendage about how her getting so much right before should be means for compliments, not hate, and quote, If I did stand up for myself and refuse to take the harassment like a good girl, I would no longer have a job. That's obviously not the case with what some Funimation VAs get away with on on Twitter, and she was able to say this at a con anyway, so clearly she just didn't seem to care, but I digress. After that, she mentions getting death threats and such with no proof, and as an ending she says, So if you wonder why I'm so loud, why I fight, why I scream my opinion, it's because I have to. Otherwise, I won't be heard, and I won't let monsters online and certain elements of the industry make me feel like my voice isn't worthy of being heard. Oh my gosh, Marky, you say it, girl. You're the strong, independent woman we need right now but don't deserve. You only made those horrific edits to Miss Kobayashi's Dragon Maid because you had to make your voice heard. You only accused Vic Mignogna of being a bad person with no evidence after being friendly and affectionate towards him for multiple years because you had to share that voice! The thing I don't think Marky understands is that she isn't funny. The edits she made to scripts are not funny. The added dialogue she creates is not funny. It only ever hurts the original work, and if she thinks only Nazis and misogynists make these kind of complaints, then it just shows her own chauvinistic, self-righteous, overly inflated ego and way of thinking. Could it be that much more of that hate and criticism most likely comes from the Vic situation you've conveniently decided to not talk about in this thread? <laughs> just thought I'd point that out as a little detail. All that's left on Marky's Twitter is a bunch of whining and arguing with fans, nothing much more to see. Over to another funny VA, Alex Moore is someone that I suppose was getting mad over people mourning the loss of Kiss Anime, one of the most well-known pirating sites for people around, and honestly one of the worst, I mean, there are much better options anyway that not that I would know, and so she decided to make a thread about why it's bullshit to her. Her first point is that if you can't watch it in your country, suck it up, bitch. It's not available to you. That's how it's supposed to be. Her second point is that if it's old, find a VHS or just let it go to time. Sorry, film and media historians, restorationists, and preservers. You shouldn't be able to keep track of the past. Just let it fade away. On a serious note, one of the greatest things about pirating websites is that they're able to preserve shows that otherwise would have faded into obscurity or completely vanished with no release or the company that made 
mean it just sitting on the IP. The idea of just letting it fade away is indeed ludicrous, but this is just for clarification. After that is some stuff about subscription services and costs, not taking into account many just wouldn't want to pay for it when the pirating sites actually have better layouts, functions, and features. She then tells people who buy merch that they should buy access to the show too, but like she said before, it could be old and out of print or simply not available in their country. What are they to do then, oh wise one? Finally, she mentions the people who dislike the insertion of politics, PC culture, and other such additions to dubs, and their want to not have it in the show. Something I can sympathize with for how annoying and cringe-inducing it can be. That's not a valid complaint though. You're just an asshole that doesn't get that these changes are needed in localization to be accessible and relevant. Yeah, you tell him, girl. You're part of Funimation, and you don't care about giving faithful dubs. Ugh! Wait, hold on a sec. What more can I say about this? Moving on. Among the voice actors for Funimation, you may have heard of this guy called Todd Habercorn. He's a pretty wholesome guy, voice of Natsu in Fairy Tale and many others, but what got him into trouble with some was his affiliation with none other than Vic Mignogna, who happens to be one of his closest friends. They've starred in shows together, dozens of videos exist of them interacting at cons, they have a clearly deep relationship as bros. That's possibly one of the reasons a person named Jesse Pridemore ended up coming forward claiming Todd had sexually assaulted her, going after after Mignana as well in the process. Unfortunately for her, Todd kept all of their email conversations and he leaked everything, completely annihilating all her claims and showing they had a consensual casual relationship. Besides that, she made lies on her Twitter claiming Vic had been deemed by the courts as a menace to society, which she never was. She even celebrated the anniversary of her coming out about it, and don't worry guys, she wasn't trying to ruin anyone. She's just noble and facing all the unproven death threats with fellow freedom fighter Jamie Markey. Can't believe Believe how heroic you are right now. After this bit, I was thinking of talking about Ron Toy, Monica Rial's fiance, and possible husband now. Also, a guy that was found out to be a domestic abuser with his ex wife and was generally shitty to fans on Twitter, doxing a 10 year old in one case. But I can only find that with YouTube videos because Ron got suspended. Sad. Lastly, the guy that played Mr. Satan went on some rants on Twitter, and it's funny because he plays no other roles, yet he acts quite high and mighty. That's about it. With that all said, I think I've covered everything I'm willing to go into. Hopefully, I got my point across. Tons of people have disliked Funimation for a myriad of reasons over a course of several years. Whether it comes down to hypocrisy, mistreatment of properties, allowing some of their VAs and staff to get away with a ton of shit on Twitter, the Vic scandal, the below average website and apps, the region locking, superiority complex, bad home releases, or just their overwhelming grip on the dubbed anime industry, I'd personally say there are plenty of reasons to not like Funimation or want to support them. That isn't to say there aren't good, honest people who work there like Todd Habercorn or Greg Ayers, but as a whole, I feel feel dirty supporting such a blasphemous company that set a low standard in many areas just for their almost monopoly on the market. There was more I could have talked about, the hole goes deeper even so with all I've gone into, but I don't want to make this video too overly long, it already is. I've been thinking of doing a similar video talking about Crunchyroll, hopefully a shorter one, but if you guys enjoyed let me know and maybe I might just do it. Thanks for watching, I'll see you all in the next one.